In terms of you know my own music, mm -hmm. it's it's been for me. I don't know if you knew what I've been working on for the last few years, but yeah. I'm just about I'm uh, I'm just about ready to finish PhD. I'm, I, I've been writing on Coltrane for the last five years. Ah, serious? I, I didn't know that. Wow, that's so yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. So I've I've been essentially what I've been doing. I started this, you know, uh, I've obviously been influenced by Train for forever. Yeah. But I started about I would say maybe in 2012. Um, I started analyzing his uh, recordings, Stellar Regions and, and Interstellar Space, the last yeah. two records, or, yeah. you know, close to the last two records that he did. And so I was transcribing those things. And while I was doing wow. that, you know, eight years ago or 10 years ago, I realized that there's a, there's a really, there's a structural thing that Coltrane is doing. So anyway, the, I was offered this, this uh, grant to come over to the UK and do yeah. this PhD. They paid, they paid for everything. So we're like, my wife and I were like, my wife had lost her job. And so we're like, do you want to go to move to the UK for a while and do this? And I was like, yeah, you know, okay. <laughs> so we came over here and I started doing that. And I did that for almost two years. And then they offered me a full-time senior lecture position wow, as a teacher. Beautiful. And then, so, so I put that, um, the PhD, instead of being full-time became part-time and so um over the last when we that was from 2016 we moved here in january of 2016 mm. so we've been here now going on exactly five years and wow. um and i'm just finishing now I've, I've finished my my first draft of the dissertation uh in Jan like about three weeks ago and it's mm. It's been a huge amount of work because I transcribed every train solo on both of those records, which took me yeah. a year. How did you do that? And, and <laughs> it was like, very hard. And it, so I, it, yeah, I mean, I would spend literally, you know, a month or two on one solo. You but know, did you slow I mean, it because, down? Like, because, or... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, certain right? things you had to slow down. Yeah, yeah you know? okay, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Okay. But 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 the trick is, is that you know when you slow it down, well, sometimes there'll be certain artifacts that are produced because of the. Yeah. So then you have to, you have to you have to kind of you know go back and forth between uh, the the actual speed and then different gradations of slower <laughs> to make sure you're not you know you're hearing what you're hearing, wow. and you know so you could spend like on like on a twenty seconds of music I could spend three hours, you know. <laughs> literally you know because there's so much in that 20 seconds yeah. you know so um so anyway so that took forever and and now i'm done with everything i've done the analysis and it's oh. i'm i'm gonna be finished now i have my uh my two advisors are looking at it right now they're gonna give me final comments i'll make amendments and then i'll i'll go in and, and submit it and then i'll be done which is really great but um are you thinking about you, publishing it or like a, yeah a yeah well? yeah i'm not sure if Good yeah, reading. I'm not sure if you're. Yeah, I'm not sure if you know the publisher uh, at you know Oxford University Publishing yeah, has good. a branch has a branch which is uh, um, you know it's called um, uh, Editions in Recorded Jazz or something mm -hmm. like that and and basically that is all about the the purpose of that those those books they have maybe 15 books they've published on jazz are all on specific recordings so mm -hmm. the editor of that is, is a guy i know jerry byron who teaches down at um at, outside of london at the university and i've spoken to him he wants me to submit a proposal for doing a book for them so wow, after i'm done with this um i'm probably I'm, yeah so i'm gonna it'll probably be out in a couple of years on Oxford University's publishing so but Beautiful. yeah so you know but it's just been it's been an enormous amount of work and and like right now like the text part of it it's like 300 pages 308 pages wow. and then the musical examples the musical because that's just the text and then the musical examples which is all the transcriptions with the analysis wow. is about 200 200 pages so it's about 500 pages total it's huge yeah wow yeah. Well, that's that's amazing so that's, that's amazing that's been taking all my time you know yeah so yeah but still i mean I've like been so I glad think... to be done with it though yeah, I know. But for you, it's it's a gratifying feeling, right? You did something basically like. Sometimes I listen to those records. It seems like impossible to do, actually, like almost. Yeah. 
you know, those loads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the type of thing, the stuff, the structures and stuff, it's really highly structured. And, yeah. and Coltrane has, you know, um, there's a lot of, of really interesting aspects to the music, you know, that, that you would think, you know, it's free, but it's not, you know, mm. there's, there's actually musical things going on stuff so and 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 uh, beneath it all there's this connection that goes on between stuff so you know even when there's a lot of varied kind of mm -hmm. things that seem different you can find that that there are certain intervals that are keep keep um that that are emphasized within those things yeah. you know wow. and then and then those things transform and become then they become part of a new structure that he then starts to develop you know it's 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 pretty amazing you know yeah, so, so, yeah, such a genius, man. You know, but just, uh, yeah, yeah, man. Jesus. Yeah, but yeah. speaking of but like, it's, uh, but it's time to get back into the world playing, you know. <laughs> but you still did it a lot, right? I mean, the playing. I, I saw you did like so oh, yeah. many like kind of free records, almost like, like, now I, in, I, in the UK. I've done, yeah, yeah, I've done a bunch. I mean, um, since I've been in the UK, I've recorded a bunch with a lot of musicians here. I mean, yeah. I continue, you know, Jeff Jeff Williams, you know, American yeah, drummer. Yeah. I, I've been playing with him for years and Jeff lives here half the time. So oh, I play with Jeff. We did a record that, uh, uh, that just came out on, um, whirlwind. For, whirlwind yeah. We played at, uh, we, we played at the London jazz festival about a year and a half ago, two years ago. And that record just came out, man, but I've been playing one, with, man, um, I don't, yeah, yeah. But I don't yeah. know if you know, Paul Dunmall and yeah, Mark sure. Sanders sure. and John Edwards. So I've been, I've been playing with them a bunch here and yeah. And they're killing. We did, We've done a, I've done a couple of records with Paul um, when, and a tour we actually did with Paul and Mark and John. That was killing. Yeah, and listen that's, to that one. so fun. And Free, Freedom Music. Oh, yeah. Right? Last year. I, I checked that one. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Damn. Super fun. It's really yeah. fun because those cats are just, you know, the textures and the shifting of the colors and, you know, it's just, yeah, it's really, it's really great. Um, and then we did, a, actually did a thing with Paul um, here, you know, Angie Sanchez, you know, Alibi's uh, ex-wife, mm -hmm. great yeah. pianist. I don't know yeah, if you're An sure, Angie. Sure. She came over and we did, we did uh, really? some trio things with Angie. Um, really? So it was me and Paul and Angie. Yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. Wow. So, so, you know, I mean, it's the thing that I miss is, is just being in contact with people because it was the first, you know, before the pandemic. I would get to see friends, you know, yeah. people coming through, you know, and I play with them and, you know, that kind of thing. And, and I've had a ton of work canceled too. Like over the pandemic, I was, you know, last year I, I had this tour with Noah Preminger um, and Dan oh, really? in New York. And yeah, cause we did oh, wow. a record with, um, we did a record with Chris Davis, Noah, Jason Palmer um, and um, Kim Cass and Ruby Royston that came out right before that. And so we did this small tour uh, in New York and Connecticut and mm -hmm. Boston. And, and then right after that, that was in January of last year or February last year. And then right after that, I got back to UK and then had a little sh string of gigs here with um, uh, um, oh, my man, um, oh God, I'm spacing on his name. You, you know him. Uh, Basically. American guitar player. No, guitar player uh, from New York who writes a lot. He does a guitar like summit workshop. Um, uh, oh, J Joel Harrison. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. had a little tour with. I was I was subbing for Benny because Benny was out in the West Coast and couldn't make it because he was yeah. worried about the pandemic. So so we did these gigs here with Gerald Cleaver and, oh, wow. and Joel and stuff, and it was fun. But <laughs> but the very like the day we were supposed to fly to Paris, well, we were taking the train to Paris. The the pandemic was just starting, and oh, and uh, you know we're hanging out and like you know, do we really want to go to Paris? They're talking about lockdown, and and so you know we ended up canceling. And Joel was really nervous about it, and so uh, rightly so. So we canceled the gig that night, and and everybody decided to try and get flights back to the states. And um, sure enough, that night. Paris at midnight locked down and we wouldn't have been able to get back to the UK. Oh, man. You know? So it was like, good thing we canceled that gig, you know, because, um, yeah, it was out. But, but you know, since then, um, it's been, you know, nothing. And I, I had a ton of tours, like from, yeah. you know, from March last year, every month I was going to be playing in a different country and it was like, they're gone. I wanted to ask you, I'll just dive in, John, like to, with some questions kind of, uh oh yeah since you were, you were talking about coltrane uh, 
and you were doing this stuff on the free emperor right like he basically did and uh, oh yeah I, wa I wanted to ask you, you 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 mentioned all these amazing cats like john edwards and mark sanders and all the other yeah, records yeah, you did like with Lee, so. liam noble and all these guys and that no no boundaries yeah. think you did and how do you approach free playing like with in any case situation you know I, i've listened to your music like a lot yeah. through all these 10 15 years and yeah like it's really complex composition wise but i want to talk yeah. about first about free playing and how, yeah. how do you approach a free playing situation let's say well i mean you know i uh it's interesting because my thought process or the way that I approach the music is, I don't think it's that different from when I'd be playing it in another kind of maybe more total setting, but um, yeah, it's, it's so much about listening and trying to find the right thing to play for what's going on or, mm -hmm. or knowing when, knowing when not to play and when to play, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, when to just let things just kind of do their, you know, do their thing. Um, you know, for me, I, you know, I enjoy, like, I, you know, I'm not one of these, um, you know, the way I hear music is, is not necessarily the way some free players would play where they're really into texture and sound, you know, like mm -hmm. cats who, who are really into, you know, can <laughs> harmonics and, and breaking things up like that. I still think still when I play, when I'm playing free, I think fundamentally, I think, you know, the way I hear things is, is still in a melodic way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so my free playing tends to be kind of, I guess, based more in that. Um, although, you know, it's fun to experiment with different sounds and shape and color and, and, you know, getting different kind of things, you know, you can get, um, you know, from the saxophone, you know, in yeah. terms of alternate fingerings and things like that, that, that create uh, kind of different contours and different kind of like, you know, dramas within the improvisation but i think that um yeah it, for me it's just about listening and, and interacting you know mm -hmm. with with the musicians and trying to figure out how it, how i can play something that makes them sound good and how i can and, and about the changing of roles right you know so so you know it's not about especially in a context where you're playing with such great improvisers that you know it's not about you soloing like in the traditional sense yeah. of you know, okay, now it's my turn. I'm going to blow. Although that will happen, you know, that can definitely happen. It does happen, but it's about like creating that more orchestral thing, you know, where, where you've got things going on over here and over here and, and how can you support it or how can you contrast or how can you create a different, you know, if, if, if a texture is one thing, how can you mm -hmm. interject, you know, something that creates momentum or, or, you know, uh, contrast you know but not too much because you know you don't want to drive things in, in a certain direction you know if if they're not going there but just to create you know interesting yeah. you know, commentary on what's going on and and so for me it's it's always trying to find that balance you know in free playing like where you know what's going on how do you relate to it how can you support it and and you know and then you know and then if it emerges where then you're a soloist at a certain point yeah. then that's fine too but I really, for me, it's really fun, the ensemble part of it and finding those, those portions and, you know, and then playing with, you know, with Paul, you know, I, it's really fun playing with Paul, the two saxophone things, yeah. you know, when we're improvising together, it's, it's um, the kind of thing where, you know, the roles change and it's like, it becomes one, one being, you know, yeah. the two of us. And it's like, like this, the, the, the dimensions of it as, as we play, certain things pop out and become more prevalent and then the other person supports it and then, then it flips and then the other thing happens. And it's, it's yeah. really, it's so much fun, you know? Yeah. So, but if, if you compare, yeah, if, so I, I guess that's, yeah. No, but if you compare, you, you know, the, 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 you've been in the UK for five years now and, you know, I think yeah, the, U, yeah, yeah. the UK has this amazing free improvised scene tradition if you compare this to the yeah. New York, let's say American free improv, yeah. since, since you lived in New York for such a long time, how, how would you set these two on a scale? Like, uh, I mean, I think it's 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 very similar. I think. I oh, mean, I don't oh. think of it. I mean, I, to me, I, you know, the thing is, is that you know, whether being in New York or being over here, you know, there are always people who have. Um, you know, certain musicians who have a certain voice and, mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, their music is a certain kind of style, like, you know, um, so, you know, you, you, 
you know, there's overlapping things where you have people who do a lot of different things and play in different kind of stylistic, you know, kind of genres, but you know, like Liam, you know, over here can play incredible changes and then he plays great free, you know, and it's like, you know, so, um, you know, I, I don't see it as being that different, um, mm -hmm. you know, although, you know, every musician has a unique voice, you know, but um, yeah, I mean, the level is, is so deep, you know, with Mark and John and Paul, that, that group is just ridiculous, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, in New York, I, I would play free, um, you know, with a lot of different musicians. Although, you know, I never, I don't think any of that music so much got on record. Um, mm. You know, uh, playing with, with Malaby or Russ Lawson or John Bear. you know, we play a lot free and oh, you know, other people, you know, but, but none of that stuff was ever really recorded. Actually, we did do a record with Russ Lawson at Systems 2 about... I don't know, maybe it's been like seven years ago now, six years ago with Michael Atias and uh, myself. And um, I think, um, who was on trombone on that session? Was it one or two trombones? And, uh, ben, uh, um, uh, ben Gerstein. Um, I really feel bad. Yes, Ben was on it, I think. I think Ben was on it. But it was a large group thing. And, oh, and it was Russell's kind of thing. Yeah, but it's not out. It never came out. <laughs> I didn't. Oh, shit. You know, so I've I've never heard it. But we, no, no, no. But it was kind of a free thing. We did some things that were, and I think there was some like, if I remember right. I think I brought in the thing that we played, and I think there was, I think Michael brought in something, and Russ had a bunch of tunes. But it's just you know so much stuff you know in your life sometimes just never sees yeah. the light of day. You know so. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so so it's been fun to be able to you know over here and to be, be able to play with such amazing musicians, you know. Um, Definitely. So yeah. we'll hopefully we'll get out of lockdown and we'll be able to do more, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, speaking of like free playing, uh, I just wanted to ask you, like, when you let's say when you started, did you ever dig into that tradition? Also, like, okay, you did now Coltrane, Tres Karimik, but. Did you like check out guys like Evan Parker or I don't know Albert Eiler also and all these guys or? Yeah, I mean a, a little bit. I mean you know I I, uh, I was never really that into Albert Eiler. I mean mm -hmm. you know I do appreciate his music, but when I was younger, the people that attracted me who were the avant gardists were you know maybe people who are more again based in more of a melodic approach. Ornette was mm -hmm. big. Ornette, oh, yeah. I loved. It that you know just yeah, incredible too. i would say i would say of of the free music ornette was probably the biggest influence on me um mm. and you know eric dolphy to a certain extent although eric's not really i don't think of him as really being avant-garde i mean he just has a unique style because you know i mm. can't think of anything other than free jazz where he's playing free yeah you know? yeah i mean you know so that's that's really the only free record he ever did that i know of you know so but um but in terms of like other musicians who you know i really dug i mean i i would listen to you know you know sure pharaoh sanders and archie mm. shep and you know these musicians cecil taylor uh, musicians who didn't you know necessarily play my instrument but you know you know anthony braxton to a certain extent um mm. you know um but you know i i I tended to kind of, I guess, kind of gravitate towards musicians who were playing more melodically. Melodic, and, yeah. and you know, one 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 record that blew me away by Evan, and and it's still, I mean, he's so amazing, it's unbelievable. But um, you know, I used to play a lot with um, Dave Phillips, and so yeah. met Bar Phillips, and have stayed at Bar's place many times when we were on tour in Europe back in the late '90s or early 2000s, and and so consequently, really got into Bar's music. And, and was really into the trio that they had with Paul Blay, you know, St. Gerald and yeah, the records. Yeah, St. Gerald. Oh, my God. And, yeah. and, and Evan yeah. sounds unbelievable. Holy. It's, yeah, it's so, so good. Um, but, you know, so, yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's funny because I don't, I don't think, um, you know, it's all, it, it, I don't think of myself as having like just one thing, you know, in terms of, I love playing, I love playing on standards, but you know, I want for me, you know, I want standards to be, you know, free, like free music. Yeah. You know, I want to have that kind of freedom and free music. Again, I don't think of as being free, you know, because, because there's lots of stuff, yeah. you know, when you're, con it's like composition, you know, you're a composer, yeah. you know, so yeah. 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 
but uh, d- d- you know we we talked about these uh, guys that you like but do you remember like speaking strictly of jazz or improvisation like who were you know we played a little together and I always regret not talking to musicians about this stuff on tours, you know, how it is. And But, uh, you know, I would like to ask you, like, who were, like, the first records or the first musicians that kind of blew your mind that you said, like, damn, you know, I want to learn how to do this stuff, like... Yeah. I mean, it was I was really lucky because I had, um, when I was growing up uh, in the 1970s, you know, in public schools where I, where I grew up in Washington State, um, there was band. I had band all the time. I started playing alto saxophone in fourth grade. Oh, so wow. I don't know, you know, so I, it was, I was really young. I think it was fourth grade. And um, so, you know, we, uh, you know, my, I can remember having a Dixieland jazz book <laughs> that I was learning, like, you know, Muskrat Ramble out of when I was like in sixth yeah. grade, you know. And um, when I got into junior high, I had, um, I think it was junior high and in, in when I grew up was like seventh, eighth and ninth grade. And I had, once I got into eighth grade and ninth grade, we had a jazz big band and I had rehearsals like at least twice a week uh-huh. in, in school. And so I was playing like Glenn Miller charts and, you know, it was really part of my childhood, you know? And, and then when I got into high school, I had big band rehearsals. I mean, I might be misremembering this, but it seemed like it was like every day in, in uh-huh. high school. Yeah, and and you know, and my band director, you know, Bruce Preniger, he was an amazing composer, and he was the director of the Spokane Jazz Society, which was the professional group in town. So, you know, uh, you know, he was like, we had, you know, I had incredible mentors, you know, mm-hmm. um, just as a young person, and so you know, I was into jazz pretty early on, and so I can remember the first recordings that I got. I think I think it was probably Charlie Parker record, mm. uh, and there was actually I mean you know I can remember walking through a department store one time and there was a saxophone record playing, and I went over to see it and I I bought it I had my mom buy it and it was this John Clemmer record Barefoot Ballet right huh. and John okay. Clemmer John Clemmer was kind of a crossover figure I mean he could play you know I don't if you go check him out you know he's he's kind of a less unknown figure because he did a lot of it was before you know there was that jazz crossover thing in pop music and he was doing like some covers of like some some more pop kind of tunes but then he did he did a record of pure improvisations called oh, Cry wow. that you know that I got when I was like 17 or something you know um, but but that was one of the first you know, like instrumental records I got, and then it went from that to um, there was a recording that was called New York Montro Connection, which was basically festival recordings of Jimmy Heath, McCoy Tyner, and mm-hmm. that had Phil Woods and uh, um, uh, there was an alto summit with Paquita de Rivera, um, Phil Woods, and oh, wow. um, Arthur Blythe. And I'd never heard Arthur Blythe before. And that, and he's playing Lush Life. And oh my God, that <laughs> recording, Arthur sounds so good. And, you know, I loved, I, you know, I was like, oh, Phil Woods is great. Oh, Arthur yeah. made a huge impact, right? So then at that point, I, I forget, I remember the next kind of big recordings I got were, um, I discovered Cannonball Adderley. Well, I, I heard Miles Davis was good and I bought, I went to a record store and bought an original copy because back then you could find them anywhere in the seventies. It was an original copy of Milestone and I mm. bought that and Sketches of Spain okay. and Milestone blew my mind. And I was like enamored with Cannonball Adderley. And so, and, and Train, I wasn't that into you know but cannibal i was i was way into so way I more accessible buying, yeah. Like, yeah so i started yeah. buying all the cannibal records i got all the miles records and from that point i was hooked and then and then i started yeah. listening to you know i listened to the bird and and you know and then slowly you know things start to branch out you know and i can also remember like taking a while to warm up the train because not long after you know somebody said oh yeah my favorite things and so I got a, I checked out a copy of my favorite things from the library and I hated it. <laughs> yeah. I hated it. I was like, I can I imagine. Can't yeah. I can't listen to this. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't for a while after that till I came back and, you know, some other recordings, you know, hooked me, but, um, 
yeah, that's kind of how it got started. And we were lucky too, because we had a radio station in the town that would play jazz a lot. Like there was mm. a college radio that played jazz constantly. And you could that was all important too. new music, weather report, and all this new stuff that was being made at that time. Plus, you know, the older stuff. And there were broadcasting concerts too, man. I can remember <laughs> listening to a concert. And I don't know if I've ever told Scott this, but Scott Robinson, it was a live broadcast from Berkeley Performance Center in like 1981. <laughs> or 82 with Scott Robinson playing. And they were talking about how he played all these different instruments. Right. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. But, you know, I mean, you consequently after moving to Europe and getting to play with and know Scott, you know, it's like, it's like, wow, you know, it's just funny making those connections when you were yeah. a kid. You know? So that's so cool. Like, no, yeah. it's funny when you mentioned the culture and think, you know, for me, it was the same. Like the, ex now I appreciate more, you know, when you're older, like, you know, I listen to the, kind of free stuff which not even sounds so free anymore like since you know we're you you're exposed to so much music when you're older and yeah. but now it's yeah. just like wow oh, this is the stuff and when i was like 18 i was like oh. i could listen to blue train record and stuff like giant steps you know and but yeah. that was still like yeah not mature enough you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well the other thing too is just knowing like you know as when you're a young person you know you tend to think of like oh a musician, you hear their record, and then you you put them in a box and think that that's mm -hmm. all they do. Yeah. That's that's their that's their music. The yeah. way that and, and that's I think that's primarily a result of the pop music industry, you know, because you think of you know Madonna and then that's that, right? It's but pop, yeah. you know, it wasn't in, it wasn't until I can remember, um, you know, starting to I had a, a relative who uh, gave me a couple records of Herbie Hancock. Mm. but his yeah. but but like the head but like the headhunters period you know and 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 so you know i can remember listening to that, those records and loving them but then when i discovered you know oh herbie played with miles davis oh what does that sound like and you know that world is just that's yeah. that's worlds apart man yeah you know so yeah. so you know i think that that it's just part of the process you know um, yeah i love that you know, yeah me too and, uh, but th then you like so from Washington State, uh, you know, you went to Berkeley, right? Yeah. So yeah, what? What I, did that? What? Did, what did that? That was the first stage, I guess, that blew your head. What did Berkeley do to yeah. you? In yeah. Oh, it was amazing. I mean, you know, I originally I had been, you know, I was born in Los Angeles and I lived there as a child until I was about seven. So, mm. you know, I, can, I have vivid memories of living in L.A., you know, from when I was a kid and then moving to Washington. It's a much smaller community you know, yeah. and, you know, different, different vibe. But um, so moving to Boston and going to school there, um, it was I'd never been to the East Coast before. And uh and so it was, it was quite an experience, man. It was, it was pretty heavy. And, you know, the thing that, that was so amazing to me was that, you know, the experience that a lot of these people who were my age, you know, my peers had and how advanced a lot of them were, was astounding. You know, I mean, I was really lucky. I mean, I've been lucky my whole life to be surrounded by, you know, world-class musicians from mm -hmm. a very young age and you know and going to berkeley immediately i was i was you know i mean i you know i mean i could play a little bit but i didn't have that much together i don't think and you know thrown into a situation where i meet donnie mccaslin and i'm in school with donnie like right away you know and and you know it's like you know i've known donnie since 1984 you know oh, it's like you know and, and 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 you know mark whitfield you know great jazz yeah, guitar yeah, player. Sure. you know cyrus chestnut was there and you know i mean oh, wow. sam newsome and, and the list goes on and on you know it, it's just like you know Dave Ballou and you know I can't even yeah. remember all the cats Mark Turner and Antonio Hart and you know oh, yeah just all like, the art generation of course yeah yeah um, yeah, yeah yeah you know sure. and 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 they're just like you know all these great musicians Tommy Smith and you know oh, shit, yeah. just you know, you know so so um for me it was just like the world you know was was just opened from that and and also understanding that you can be you can be an artist because you know growing up where i was there weren't people weren't artists primarily you know it was like oh you know you were a school teacher and then you played music on the side yeah. you know <laughs> um and and you know so it was like wow there are actually people who are just musical artists that's amazing you know uh, <laughs> so and you know it yeah it, it was really 
uh, an amazing experience. It was a great time to be in Boston. Um, and, you know, and, 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 you know, as, as, you know, you know, and, and as, as uh, students will find out that, you know, the connections you make, the people that you meet, you know, as a young person in school will last your whole life, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I continue to, to work with these people and see them, and, you know, it's, and that, you know, and that continued, you know, has gone on. Like when I went to, eventually moved to New York and went to Manhattan School of Music, same thing, you know? Um, you know, those, those relationships are really important, you know? How was this? You moved to New York beginning of the 90s or mid 90s or? Eight, 1988. Hey, oh, already. Wow. So yeah, how, yeah. how was that, that change then for you? You know, like it was a big as change. A young guy, you know, coming to New York and the whole scene and yeah, it was very exciting. I mean, you know, because um, it was one of those things that, you know, we, when I lived in Boston as a student, you know, we would go down to New York to go hear music sometimes, you know, back then there were these flights on people's express you could get for like 15 bucks and, you know, one way. Right. Wow. And, and so we, I can remember going down to the Vanguard and seeing like, um, uh, I think Elvin Jones oh, wow. uh, play in, you know, we, so we, i had been to New York a couple times, um, but then moving there was like a whole nother, you know, whole nother thing. Um, and then learning this, learning where everything was in the city and the subways. And, and when I first moved there, I actually, um, when I first moved into Manhattan, I had an apartment in the West Village around the corner from Sweet Basil's. Mm, so wow. I lived there for six months and I got a day gig as everyone does, you know, and so, but I would make the rounds to all the jazz clubs every night and see what was going on. And then I would, I would basically, my, my, my gig was um, working at this bookstore really early in the morning, like 4 a.m. to noon. Oh, right? wow. So, so, so I would, I would, I was basically a night owl at that point. So I would stay up all night, go to work, and then I would work and then I'd go home and sleep and then I'd wake up in the afternoon and then do it all over again. You know? <laughs> so, but yeah, it was an amazing experience, you know, and being around, you know, at that time, 1988, you know, it was, it was the shades of the old jazz scene. All the masters were still alive. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can remember going to Bradley's and going up town to McHale's and, you know, and hanging out, you know, and seeing everyone, you know, Tommy Flanagan and, you know, Freddie Hubbard and mm. George Coleman hanging out and, you know, just on and on and on and on, you know, and, and then that the younger generation, like Chris McBride was hanging out, you know, he's about my age, you know, yeah. Chris is like, I can remember seeing him at Bradley's and, you know, just like being a fly on the wall, observing like that, you know, it was amazing. And, yeah. um, you know, yeah. And those days are gone. And, you know, unfortunately when you're young, yeah. you don't really, you don't really clock it for what it is, for how significant it is, you know? Yeah. And I wish, yeah. I wish I had appreciated it more, you know, but yeah. 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 But uh, th that's true what you say. Like I remember it's, you take some things for granted, you know, like yeah. uh, I, yeah. I think about it in the past, like so, some touring you did or I did or, yeah. you know, I, I played with Donnie McCaslin, like we did like a sure. two week tour with Gerald and John Aber. And that was oh, one yeah. of the best tours I did. And, you know, uh, it was for me like 2007, I was like, yeah, we're touring, you know, like it was yeah. kind of natural, but I don't know if you know, know what I mean. It's like, I should have taken it more, like more appreciated yeah. in the moment. Like, man, you Absolutely. know, this is like, this is, you know, it, it's amazing cats yeah. you're playing with. Yeah, yeah. And you should, yeah. you know, or like the, the stuff we did and, you know, everything. Like, yeah. yeah. I think, I think as you get older though, I think you, you, you come to recognize those moments, yeah. those special moments, and and you and and I, I know for myself that I appreciate them so yeah. much more. Yeah. And and I know and I know and I I've been kind of become more aware of that over the years too. You know, I can remember, you know, when I was playing with Joe Henderson's big band. Yeah. And that that to me, I was like, I really really was appreciative of the experience and savored it and knew that this was a moment that that you know you have to you have to really acknowledge as being special you know so how, how did those this kinds happen? of things the, the story uh, with playing with joe yeah how oh. did, i wanted well, to ask you that but since you mentioned yeah, it now you know yeah how did i mean well it was one of those things that just you know happened because of friends as you always do in mm. jazz you know people you know it's 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 how you you know it's a social thing you know you play with people you know and and so for me i had become friends with bob belden and I lived next door to Bob um, in the late 80s, early 90s. 
and Bob um, was involved, you know, with Blue Note Records and Verve as a lot of times, well, he became an A&R guy at Blue Note, but Bob um, was a great arranger, a great tenor player. And Bob was, uh, had done projects at that time producing um, his own records, but also he did a record called The New Standards with Herbie Hancock and, yeah. you know, kind of an all-star group. And Bob was also uh, at that time, you know, producing things that weren't his music. And so he was involved with Verve with, uh, I'm not sure how, I mean, sure, assuming Richard Seidel at Verve contacted him or whatever, but yeah. um, so he was involved with producing Joe's big band record. And and so there had been some recording done a couple years before um, with an alternate group. And I can't remember, maybe it was only a year or two before that had been done. and. So then Bob um, organized the charts. There were charts written by Mike Mossman and Slide Hampton mm -hmm. and Bob wrote a couple of charts. And then there were a couple by Joe because Joe used to have a band um, back in the day that he had written some things for. So Bob produced the session for Verve and, you know, they, he didn't, they didn't want it to be um, like, uh, essentially they didn't want it to be like the, you know, vanguard band you know mm -hmm. just being basically joe with a vanguard band they wanted to have like a mixture of people from outside and you know and bob also was was such a great cat for nurturing young musicians and stuff you know i mean all you know for years after uh, you know bob you'd see bob promoting young musicians so anyway at the at the recording session you know the recording session predominantly the, the days that i was there was most of the tracks were done by dick oates and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, steve wilson on alto and then the rest of the sax section were i mean it was the sax the band it's chick Corea was playing piano yeah, yeah no, you know like I mean, was, everybody yeah. was there but but um it was um uh, the sax section was primarily dick oates and steve wilson and uh um if I remember right, Gary Smalley was on Barry. Mm. I think Charlie Pillow on tenor and Tim Reese on tenor was yeah, wow. was the, the group. And then I came in uh, like, like after they had recorded several tracks on the day, and I did I think I did two two of the tracks. I did record a May and maybe Step Lightly. I don't remember, but um, but anyway, so you know, that was an amazing experience just going and recording with him and being thrown into that situation. And that was, you know, that was just Bob doing me a solid. Bob's like, man, you want to, you know, because the the idea was also that this band would eventually go and do some mm. touring and some gigs. So we ended up doing, um, uh, uh, after that, when the record was came out, we ended up doing a week of gigs at um, Blue Note. Oh, and really? It oh, was wow. a, yeah, and so it was the same band but it was me and Steve Wilson. Steve was playing lead on those second. And then Chris Potter was playing tenor. Oh. And um, and Tim Reese was playing Barry, I think. And then I think Charlie Pillow was playing tenor. Uh, I think that, was that the band? Yeah, I think that was the band. And then, um, and the, you know, most of the other cats who had been on the session were also there too. And so we did a week of those gigs and, but that was it. That, you know, that was, that was all that that band ever did, which was a shame because, uh, Unfortunately, it was a time when Verve um, had basically produced a record that was the soundtrack for this Robert Altman movie called Kansas City. Kansas City, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And that movie was had come out at the same time, so uh, Verve ended up, you know, collaborating with, you know, on these tours to promote the Kansas City big band and then the Joe Henderson trio with Al Foster and George Morales. Mm. And so instead of taking out the George, the Joe Henderson big band, which initially I thought was going to happen, it ended up being Joe took the trio out and then the big, the Kansas city big band. And then they did these, you know, tour junkets where they, you know, they all played together, but you know, just the, the, the week of the week of gigs and the recording was, was. Did you, did you talk to Joe or. Yeah. About yeah. music and was, stuff. And uh, I mean, not not a ton because you know I, I spoke to him, you know, a little bit, um, you know, every yeah. day. You know, we'd say hello or whatever. And, but the the thing was is that Joe kind of kept to himself, and because the band there was like what fifteen of us. Yeah. Okay. They didn't, you know, you don't want fifteen cats like all over Joe. You know? yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, Joe was really cool, and and Joe was really supportive too. He was really nice to me, and you know, so said some nice things. So you know, yeah. 
it was, yeah. it was, it was an amazing experience. You know, it was one, it was uh, unfortunately way too short for my, for my liking. I would have liked it to last longer, but, sure. but yeah, but you know, that's one of those, those things. You know, yeah. You kind of cherish. But uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, to ask you this, uh, this record was like 1998, I think, or 97. Yeah. 80, 98. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it was '98, something so like that. So this was even this was before you did your first record as a band leader, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. And I wanted to ask you, your first one was Axiom, right, with Aber and yeah. and I wanted and, to ask and you, Ma yeah, I, lo I love that record. And and uh, how how did you de decide to become a band leader? When was that you moment know, I, when you said like, okay, I, I will write music and white guys? And how did this happen? Yeah, I you know. Um, I would always been interested in doing that. It, it's just one of those things that I, I, you know, I didn't really know what music I wanted to make, you know, I mean, you know, when you're young, you know, especially, you know, I think in your early twenties, it's all about discovering who you are, you know, trying to figure out where you fit. And, you know, and I liked a lot of different types of music, mm -hmm. you know, I love bird and I love, uh, you know, avant-garde music and you know and i played in a lot of both of those situations as side bands and you know i love i love playing in big bands i love you know a lot of diverse things and so for me you know i wasn't just like the the out guy who just played free you know i wasn't the guy who just played bebop you mm -hmm. know i i and and so you know as being kind of somebody in kind of in the middle you i think it, it's a little harder because you have to figure out you know like what you know what is the music that i want to make because it's not just this and it's not just mm -hmm. that you know it's like tony and, mallory right kind of tony yeah, said, said the same thing that yeah. the free, free cats thought he's a kind of standard guy and the standard guy said like well you're too free in a way like you know exactly yeah. right yeah, yeah exactly right like the the bebop guys who are really in that you know think that i'm like a free guy you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. so it's like but the free guys don't see me as a free guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's, 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 it's weird. So, so for me, it was like figuring out, you know, what the music I wanted to make that reflected my, my thing. Mm. And, and so, yeah, so that band came out as a result of that. And, you know, in the nineties, um, you know, especially mid to late nineties and early two thousands, I was playing a lot in a lot of musical situations with, with uh, Tony and with John um, and I had met Jeff Williams about that time um, and started playing in a trio with Jeff. Jeff, uh, the first band I played with Jeff was actually a trio that he put together with Peter Madsen and myself. Great, oh, Peter's really? great, yeah. great piano, piano player. player. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Peter's awesome. And, uh, and so we, the group is funny. We played at this coffee place in Brooklyn a bunch of times. And I think we might've done some other, maybe one or two other gigs, but um, he, uh, um, so that music we played a lot of, of standards and we played a lot of Peter's music and then it was called left hand compliment right which basically <laughs> Peter because because Peter was playing keyboard you know he would play a lot of left hand bass things right yeah. so left hand compliment but it was like the best band name ever maybe but <laughs> but anyway um so uh from that you know then when I formed you know the quartet mm -hmm. uh, because I'd been playing with Jeff in, in that context. I really wanted to play some more with him, but with my music, and so that's how that that group kind of formed. And we we did a bunch of gigs in New York for several years. Uh, that band probably existed from, I'm going to say maybe from about 1999 or maybe 2000 until mm -hmm. maybe 2006. You know? Oh wow, that's quite long. Yeah, 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 yeah. something like that. So yeah. yeah, 2005 maybe some maybe five or six years, but but anyway, yeah. So that's how that happened, and and that music, um, you know, was stuff that we I'd been working on that we had been playing on gigs and things, you know. So yeah. But how do you you know you you mentioned working on stuff now? It's a wide question, but still, like, how, how do you 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 know when I talk to musicians, like. Uh, and you know, when it comes to challenging music, everyone like many mention your name, like that. It's like really, really some of the most so, challenging, challenging stuff. Uh, that it's good, I guess good, it's... <laughs> good stuff, but it's really challenging to play. And you know, for me also, when I listen to you know, I listen to the Life in Brooklyn with Johannes and Mark Ferber, yeah. and it's incredible. You know, I love uh, saxophone trios. I mean, like without piano, because it's so much, you know, the S Sonny records that he did in trio, like the, I've been such a fan of that. And like this format is amazing. And what you guys did there, do there, it's, 
amazing. And rhythmically, I get also like, you know, I don't know, blood ties the song. Like you you do these intervals and rhythmically, I just get lost then or like, you know, pro oblique, like, and it's, it's, you know, I count something, it's like a five and then it's a seven and then I get lost. But anyway, I wanted, yeah. to, I wanted to ask you about your compositional process. How do you approach a composition or um, how do you approach it? Do you have like a daily routine or do you have it in mind like a trio you're going to write for a trio format or? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, as with as with everything, you know, I mean, you change over time. So my writing has changed over time. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, um, since since my first record. But I mean, I think the one thing that's that's common to it all is that I've always been interested in writing tunes that add um, that you weren't like that had written parts for everyone that weren't necessarily lead sheets, you know, mm -hmm. um, because I really wanted to explore like, like, you know, in more detail, how the structure of the tune, you know, is, is, is built. And so, you know, like the music on Axiom and that record, everything is written yeah. out, you know, all the bass lines and yeah. no chord changes, you know, or anything. Um, and uh, the improvisations, I mean, sometimes I think there's a couple tunes that I do have chord changes on, but but for the most part, um, you know, the improvisational sections are based on, you know, melodic constructs and, and forms and rhythms, you know, yeah. so that the harmonies, harmonies can be implied by, by you know, perhaps backgrounds or they can be implied by bass lines, but, but they're not necessarily, um, you know, if you want to play off of those structures, those harmonic structures, that's cool. You know, for me, I just want to give the, the soloist and the players information that they can use then to go and, and mm -hmm. you know, kind of, so it can be built into the tune. But um, I think, you know, as, as my writing has kind of changed over the years, you know, the focus, I've, I've tended to get less, I, I think more, interested in more organic structures yeah. like you know the last record that i did which is the trio record with mark um the live in brooklyn one at that point i'd written a bunch of new short pieces that i had been trying to flesh out that had kind of real organic shapes to them that weren't so metric but that that you know that might have asymmetrical phrases and and you know Kind of odd meter components to them, but that 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 music wasn't about that, you know, mm -hmm. or that it's not it's not about you know playing these kind of you know things as as an exercise or as an acrobatic kind of thing, yeah. you know, um, and and so uh, you know, and but you know it, earlier on I was you know very interested in, and I'm still interested in, you know, kind of like you know being really rigorous about the pitch structure. And being really rigorous about the the um, uh, development of rhythm, so that yeah. that so that everything is there for a reason, you know, um, and you know, and then during the compositional process, I mean, I do a lot of times, uh, you know, pre-compositional sketches of what the material is going to be. Yeah, you know, so I'll be thinking that. About, How do you do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll be thinking about like you know. Um, whatever the vibe is of the tune, like if I'm trying to evoke a certain sense, a certain feeling and, and what the material is that will produce that. And then, you know, I'll start to design composition based around, you know, really developing specific tools, you know, whether it's like one of the tunes that I, that I, as an example, um, I think is, uh, um, which tune is that? Uh, well, one of one of my tunes. I, I'm not really on the new one. Movie. I mean, on the last. Yeah, I'm so, uh, it's um, it's uh, oh man, what's it's been so long since I played it. I can't even remember it. <laughs> not uh, not or not Ouroboros. It's uh, it's another. Anyway, it's a composition that was based about around like kind of capturing an African folk kind of vibe, mm -hmm. and but yet yeah, using contemporary pitch structures. So I used the 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 pitch structure was based around kind of implying a certain kind of pentatonicism, but without pentatonic scales and mm -hmm. using more chromatic pitches within that. And then utilizing a, a certain um, rhythmic grid that was synthesizing layers of two, three, no, three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. And so then creating like, like it, essentially it's, it's an ostinato pattern, a rhythmic pattern, but then breaking that down into to different parts so that yeah. you get kind of an African, um, you can you can hear it in terms of the triplet feel, or you can hear it in terms of the five feel, or you can hear it in terms of the four feel because they're yeah. all layered, 
you know, there. And so for me, you know, like the, but the whole impetus of that was this kind of like, you know, African folk song idea, but then kind of turning it on its head, you know, so yeah. that it's, you know, and, and so that all of that was pre-compositional ideas. And then as we work on it, you know, is this kind of getting what I need and, you know, how can I, how can I, get what I'm kind of hearing in my head, you know, from the tools that I'm using, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, and, 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 you know, I'm kind of a nerd that way, I guess, you know, because I'm, uh, you know, I, but in recent times though, now I've, I've been trying to be a lot more open um, and less, you know, maybe a little less kind of stringent in the exclusivity of things, you know, and letting more things blend and come together, you know? Yeah, I, was, I think with the trio, you, you guys do that already on the last one, the honeycomb. Yeah, it's, yeah, It's yeah, really yeah. organic, like like you said. It's it's sometimes yeah. it sounds almost free in what right. you guys are doing because it just moves. So I guess well, that that's, was that's the idea. Yeah, that's the thing that interests me about the, like the trio format because I've done a lot of trio records yeah, actually, yeah. and um and and for me. You know the trio format is like it's like the Ferrari of jazz groups because it's it's it is because you have um you it's really it's really flexible you know it, you can like you know it's got it can corner on a dime man you know and and you know the because there are fewer people involved there's more it's faster and it's yeah. and it and there's more there's more potential you know there's more potential to create really um unusual interesting kind of things going on yeah. the more people you add i mean you get a, a you know obviously you know there are advantages to to more people but there yeah. also become the complexity and of, of the group and the interaction it becomes a little more weighted down so yeah so i mean for for the trio with mark and johannes you know one of the things is that they're so great they're amazing yeah. musicians and that 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 once we have a tune together, you know, being able to play around a tune and and you know shift things, move things, bar lines, and but then always keep the form, you know, yeah. is uh, is an amazing thing. And the way that that you know certain you know aspects might become clouded at a certain point, but then all of a sudden there'll be this ray of sunshine that comes down through, and boom, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, and and that's and for me it's really exciting to play in context like that, you know. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, as a listener too, I love hearing music that's like that, that, that continually surprises me and, you know, with, with the way that there can be, you know, kind of complexity and then simplicity and then all yeah. of a sudden something new happens and it's like, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's cool. The, 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 you, you like being a bad leader or like, you know, I, I do. speaking of trios or... How would you yeah, describe yourself as a band leader? I mean, uh, well, I, I think, yeah, it's a tough one. I think I've gotten better over the years doing it. Um, uh, yeah, I, I enjoy it. I, I think that, you know, as I've gotten older, you know, I've gotten a better idea of what the music I want to mm -hmm. do. Yeah. Um, and so, so as a part of that, you know, it naturally lends itself to, you know, being a band leader. I mean, I, it's funny because I think that in general, most, I think, I don't know what reputation I have, if any, but I think in general, uh, you know, I've done so much work as a side man. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, that a lot of times maybe, maybe I'm thought of as kind of a guy who does a lot of that, you know, and, hmm, interesting. you know, but, like that, but huh? I mean, I, I, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's hard to kind of say, but, but, you know, I've worked with a lot of different bands in, yeah. over the years and, you know, I mean, I've done my bands as much as I can, you know, i Obviously, <laughs> over the last few years, I've kind of suspended, you know, you know, working on any new recordings or anything because of the Coltrane project yeah. that I'm working on. But um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's one of those things that going, you know, going forward, you know, I'm really there's a lot of projects that I want to work on and being able to do uh, more new kind of projects. I mean. You know, obviously, the band with Mark and Johannes. Johannes is, um, you know living in Germany right now for the oh, really? lockdown. So yeah, yeah he's this. there with oh. his family. Yeah. So he's he's there right now. I think he's going back to the States um maybe this month. Well February, I think mm. he'll be going back. But yeah, so you know, um we'll see. I mean there's a bunch of things that I'm, I'm I have ideas for groups that have been sitting kind of in the background yeah, yeah. that I haven't <laughs> had time to work on, you know. So yeah. hopefully get to those this this next year. 
Yeah. Funny, fu funny that you, you know, I've always, I always saw you as a band leader because, you know, the first records, I've, there, there used to be like this platform years ago, this, I think it was called eMusic. And you, oh, you yeah. could, you know that? Like, uh, you could, I've heard of it, yeah. It was like a subscription service, like that you paid, I don't know, 30 euros. And you mm -hmm. could download MP3s of 10 albums, you know, and I was, I don't know, I was discovering the scene, like this is, we're talking now shit 18 years ago or 15 yeah. years ago. And, you know, like all these new albums and I found out your records and fresh sound and, you know, the, and I was like, always saw you as a band leader and composer, or, yeah. you know, it's funny that yeah. Uh, you. I, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, you know. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think that it just depends on the context of people. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, that sure. people know you and, you know. Yeah, yeah, but, sure. um, yeah. but it's, it's yeah, being a band leader is great. You know, I mean, you've done so many projects as a leader. Yeah. You know? yeah. So I love doing you know, that. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's a certain gratification of seeing, yeah. you know, our hard work kind of come to realization. Yeah. There's nothing like hearing, hearing new music that you've written played for the first time. Yeah. You know, it's like super exciting. I will, I will never forget, that, like, sometimes I tell my students this, like, uh, when we met with Lauren and Roberto for that yeah. kind of shortest tour, I think you guys flew into Zurich. Yeah. We drove to Zurich seven hours. We had the gig on the same day. And right. we had, like, those amazingly long compositions. Like, I wrote, like, I don't I know, know, six, seven pages. And yeah. you guys just, you know, we counted off, I counted off of the rehearsal, the first song, and you nailed it. And then you just like after the song, like yeah, sorry for that one mistake there or something. I was like, that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> playing against some incredible meters and everything. I was like, okay, that's that's so cool, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that first gig wasn't that for um, Kulak and Kulak. Bond, yeah, 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 in Bond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, but I remember yeah. this. You know, like you guys just like bah, nailed it, like everything. And yeah, that it, I, I was, it was fun. Bah. Yeah, it was it was a fun tour, man. You know, yeah. um, Lauren and I, Lauren and I had, had known to get each other for a long time, and um, it was the first chance that we had actually done anything like that together. Yeah. So that was a great opportunity, you know. It was so but, natural. Yeah, that was super fun. Two elders, yeah. like damn, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How how was Roberto? I haven't seen him in a very long time since that. Uh, I we, we played together for a long. We played together for fifteen years, but then we kind of. I kind of shift some projects, so I haven't seen him now like for three, yeah. four years. So okay, I that's I mean that's natural. That's the way life is, you know. Yeah, yeah. But he, yeah. he seemed yeah. to be okay the last time we spoke. You know, doing lots of solo playing and stuff. So great, uh, great. Which he always did. So, but uh, yeah. John, just one last question, so, to, so that yeah. I don't take too much of your time. Uh, I just wanted <laughs> to ask you about this uh, one project you did, which was the Webern project. Oh yeah. Uh, which I really loved, and I wanted to ask you, how did you set up that animal together? I know, I know it's been a while ago, but like, where did this idea yeah. come from? I mean, I know you've been working on yeah. twelve ton rows, and you put out a book and everything, and yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, Webern was always, you know, one of my favorite composers. You know, his music is so, you know, when you listen to his music, it's there's such an identity there. You know, it's even though it's twelve tone music, it's it's yeah. so personal to him and. <laughs> So, you know, my, my thought was it would, you know, some of his pieces, when I would listen to them, you know, they sounded like, like jazz tunes, like things that we would improvise or things we would yeah. play. And I thought, you know, okay, I want to, I want to do something with this music. And it was really important that in doing that project that they retain the essence of what those pieces are, because, you know, if I just abstracted, from what essentially are pretty abstract pieces to begin with, then that's kind of, there's no purpose in that, you know, it's, it's like, so, so I wanted to actually translate those, those pieces into, you know, kind of a jazz, jazz genre, and then, you know, look at them as improv, improvisational vehicles, you know, yeah. so I went through that project and, you know, found pieces that really resonated with me as having a certain kind of character. And, um, as, as feeling like, you know, a really close connection. There were some pieces that struck me as, as, as being indicative of, of, you know, certain types of jazz, like, um, you know, Opus 25, it, which is a piano piece for, for voice, struck me as being a monk tune, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Really, it was like uh-huh. like, like um, totally like a monk tune, and and so I kind of I, I kind of re envisioned it as that, and and in, and in rewriting that, the other thing for me was like the ensemble context because I wanted to have a, a, an ensemble that had a lot of different. Um, you know, colors and a lot of different yeah. textures. And, you know, uh, I love, you know, Russ Lawson and I've played with him for so long that that I wanted to use Russ, um, you know, in a context where he was, because I've heard him and played with him when he's playing electric keyboards and, mm-hmm. and playing organ. And I thought, man, Russ would kill this on like organ. And so, and then, um, you know, guitar, uh, I've been playing with Pete a lot and Pete is amazing, Pete McCann. And yeah. so it was like, well, you know, have piano and guitar, keyboards and guitar. And Matt Moran, uh, who I'd known for a long time, but actually never really worked with outside of a couple, you know, instances where we were both sidemen. So, um, so you know, called Matt. And uh, and then, you know, Tyshawn, I had known for a long time and, and played with him in different, different contexts and done a couple records with him. And, and you know, because, you know, I... I, I, you know, I love Tyshawn. I love him as a person and I love his playing yeah. and I know his affinity for classical music, yeah. you know, and, and Weber in particular. So I thought, you know, this would be a great project for us to, to do together. So, so, you know, he was way into it. He loved, loved the idea. And, and, uh, you know, and Johannes and I go so far back and he's such a master bass player, you know, it's yeah. like, it's no brainer. So, you know, and, and so that was the core of the group. And as I was, working on the pieces, I realized that, you know, I really did want to retain, because a lot of his pieces were written for voice, I wanted to retain the voice on a couple of them, because yeah. I thought it was really appropriate. Yeah. So then then I had done um, what was friends with Mar- Margaret, uh, who's an amazing vocalist, and and um, I thought, you know, the quality of her voice really matched what I was looking for, and I, um, and I knew that Margaret actually spoke German, and mm. I wanted to do it in the in the original language, yeah, so I thought you know that that would be a great you know a great component for you know the, the pieces that needed it, and so that was you know kind of the impetus for that. Um, I guess the after choosing the pieces, you know, important aspect for me was to um, kind of translate the music, and, and you know, so what I would do is look, I would make um, I, a lot of times I would make condensed scores. So, so from the orchestral pieces or from like, mm-hmm. you know, the, uh, the, the Weber and Quartet, I would make a condensed score. And then I would start to extrapolate things from the condensed score oh, yeah. and, so and, cool. and, pick, and pick different things out from that. Um, and, you know, and, and also like, uh, like on the string quartet one also, you know, creating condensed score from that was really useful. And then kind of figuring out, you know, how I'm going to deal with the rhythmic aspects of that. And a, a lot of, a lot of it was, was analytical too. Like, you know, in order to figure out how I was going to develop material, you know, I had to figure out what, what made it tick, you know, yeah, what, how yeah, was yeah. it constructed. So, you know, and, and dev- designing like improvisational structures on, you know, sections on the, on the piece, you know, it was really important to understand how the piece was working, you know, so, um, you know, like Opus, uh, um, oh man, I can't remember the numbers, I think it's Opus 27, the piano variations, that one was, was a key kind of analytical thing where, you know, in order to, to structure like the shout chorus and the improvisational section, which is really hinged on the composition itself. Like how does that reflect it, you know? And, and then, you know, then also understanding the, the composition structure, you know, like playing the out, like the way I was going to end the tune, you know, I didn't want it to be the same as the end. So yeah. then, but it turns out that they went, you know, the way that, that Vabern constructed it was, was the symmetrical structure. And then it worked out that I could play, the themes simultaneously so I could take the tune and just overlap it on itself and it would work you know and so it was like you know so a lot of the tunes had had um you know had that kind of aspect it was really uh, I found it really gratifying in that you know it was um, the kind of thing where it's like you're trying to figure out a puzzle you know yeah you know and how you know, to, uh, yeah. So, and I had worked on, I actually, I, I had intentions of doing another Vabrum project record. Oh, really? And oh, wow. I, yeah. And I have, I have sketches for three other, three other tunes. Oh, wow. There's, That's there's some cool, stuff man. that we, that didn't, yeah, there's some stuff that didn't make it on the record. There's two tracks or one track that we recorded that didn't make it on the record. And so there was that idea that that might be something down the road, but you know, it's kind of yeah. been put on the, 
put but on did, did you guys tour with this project also? Like we did, we did a few gigs. We played. Um, there was a, a festival. Interesting. There was this this uh, festival at um, Le Poisson Rouge that was all about yeah. uh, uh, German, you know, music of of the 1920s, and so we were one of the bands that did that, oh, wow. you know. Um, and we also played, you know, we played, <laughs> funny thing is, you know, I love Spike, you know, at Smalls and Spike, I played at yeah. Smalls a lot. And, and Spike was gracious enough to offer me a gig there with the Babern Project. So we played with the Babern Project at Smalls, which wow. seems kind of like an odd combination, yeah. right? Yeah. But it was, it was a killing gig, man. It was so much fun. And um, I can remember uh, after the gig running into Ned Gould, who's an amazing tenor player who plays a lot at Smalls. And, and I didn't really know Ned very well, just, you know, reputation. And, and Ned is like, yeah, man. He says, <laughs> I saw, I saw a Vapor project on the chalkboard. You know, I'm like, what, what is that? Oh man, that's got And then he says, man, but it was killing. <laughs> so, you know, so I just thought that was the highest praise, you know, coming from Ned, you know. Like, like, you know, what a dumb idea. And it's like, oh, oh but it was great. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. Uh, John, John, you uh, just uh, mentioned touring now. Remember, do, do you remember your first tour you did in Europe? And who was that with? Um, in Europe, yeah. I think the first time I came to Europe was with Dave Phillips and this band Free Dance. Free Dance. Ah, yeah. Reza Res and Tony Moreno. How was that um, like for you the first time, like touring coming? It was amazing. I think that that tour we we went to, we flew into Paris. We had a gig at, uh, playing uh, at, for uh, Radio France mm -hmm. and at their big studio, and it was pretty mind blowing, man. It was great. Uh, yeah, I can remember like the first time, man. It was like holy crap, the world is a big place. This is amazing. <laughs> That's you know? a good... Yeah, yeah, big, big. You know, it makes a big impression the first time you go abroad. It really yeah. does, you know, and, you know, consequently, you know, I've been back, you know, obviously I'm living here now, but uh, it's been, you know, I love Europe and I've always loved Europe and, uh, you know, all the different, you know, traveling around, you know, different cult cultures and different countries is, is one of the great joys of being a musician, you know, yeah. it's, no. a re it's a real yeah. blessing to be able to yeah. do that, you yeah. know, so, <laughs> but, so, but yeah, so that, that band, we actually had gone to, when I played with, when we were all, uh, you know, doing records and stuff and touring with that band, we did a lot of tours in the States as well, but we, we did come to France. I was, that was probably when I was going to France most frequently, like I was in France, you know, at least, you know, once or twice a year for mm -hmm. several years. Wow. And, and, and I, and consequently, I, I mean, it's funny how you go through different stages well you'll go someplace a lot and then you won't go there for a decade you know yeah. and then it'll be like you know so yeah. i i haven't really played in france that much in recent years which is unfortunate because i love it you know yeah. i love it but you know that's just the way life life goes but. yeah doctor jazz <laughs> Jazz. Yes. 